computer. So recording. Awesome. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Misha Cooper, and I'm an academic advisor at ET and work with a lot of pre-law students and other majors. Um, but we are so honored to have two guests from the University of Memphis School of Law joining us tonight. Um, I wanted to first just thank you so much for your time and agreeing to speak with our students tonight. We really appreciate it. And just welcome everyone coming into the group tonight. We're going to have a great talk here and on the eve of a presidential debate, so it's great timing. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Sue Ann McClellan. She's the sis Assistant Dean of Law School Admissions, Recruiting, and Scholarships for the University of Memphis, Cecil C. Humphreys School of Law. You'll have to correct me if I mispronounce it. You got it. it. And Dean McClellan is a seasoned law admissions professional who has worked at the University of Memphis for more than two decades. She's a friend to UTK and every year a significant number of UT grads matriculate to Memphis Law. So um, stick around at the end of the talk if anyone has any law admissions related questions, particularly for University of Memphis. Um, she'll be available at the end of the program and if time runs out, she'll put her email in the chat box so anyone who wants to contact her, they can. So without further ado, Dean McClellan. Thank you, Misha. It's my pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity. When we were talking earlier, we were trying to figure out a timely topic. And I said, I have just the professor for a timely topic in an election year. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce Mr. Mulroy. Steve Mulroy is the Bredesen Professor of Law at the University of Memphis, where he teaches constitutional law, civil rights, criminal law, and election law. A former U.S. Justice Department civil rights lawyer and federal prosecutor, Professor Mulroy has published scholarly articles and book chapters on criminal procedure and voting rights, as well as last year's books, Rethinking the U.S. Election Law. Since becoming a law professor, he served as a pro bono counsel in a number of voting rights cases, including Palm Beach, Cal Cal Be excuse me, Palm Beach County, California, butterfly ballot case involving the 2000 presidential election. Several death penalty cases, including the first Tennessee commutation of a death sentence in 40 years, and more recently, litigation expanding the absentee voting during the pandemic here in Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Mulroy, for that. He published op-ed pieces in Newsweek, U.S. News World Report, The New Republic, Slate, Salon, and The Hill. Nationally, he's appeared as a legal commentator numerous times on Fox News, MSNBC, and CNN. He's been quoted as such media organizations as the Associated Press, USA Today, The Washington Post, The Washington Times, People Magazine, and The Daily Caller. He's also the former Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the law school where I had the pleasure of working with him during that time. His hobbies include procrastinating and high impact diving. Both his blood type and chirpy personality motto are B positive. Without further ado, Mr. Mulroy. Thank you, Sue Ann. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you today. Uh, I, I think it's great that there are so many of you turned out today and you're from all over. So um, I'm happy to talk to you. I, I would like to encourage you to ask questions as we go along. I'm hoping that I can uh, get through my presentation and still leave a fair amount of time for questions at the end, but you don't need to wait until the end. You can either speak up or use the chat feature. And Sue Ann, I think I need to have uh, you enable my uh, sharing of the screen. Uh, I thought I did that. Okay. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. One person, okay. Multiple participations. Let me see if that works. See if you can do anything now. I can, I right. can. Okay, so there we go. All right, and I, I gave this the uh, snarky title, Graduating from the Electoral College, and I will spend a fair amount of time talking about that because I think since we're weeks away from a presidential election and uh, the last presidential election, the Electoral College and the popular vote results were different. It uh, should be on everybody's minds. But I, I won't confine my topics to that because I think there are some other things as we head into the last presidential debate and we're all you know, worrying about 
um, potential electoral mishaps. So I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things. In addition to the electoral college, I'm gonna speak briefly about mail voting, what to expect on election night, and the possibility of post-election challenges. So let's begin with the electoral college. Um, maybe some of you already know, but certainly by the time you graduate law school, you're gonna know that we don't actually have a right to vote for uh, president. Let's see, we don't really have a right to vote for uh, president. N nothing in the Constitution says that we can. In fact, what the Constitution uh, says, and that should be Article Two, actually, says that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct electors to the electoral college. And the Supreme Court has taken the plain language of this and interpreted it to say that state legislatures, the legislative body of each state has plenary authority, full complete authority over the allocation of electors in the electoral college. So at any point, the Tennessee legislature could pass a law saying we hereby abolish presidential elections and from now on all of our electoral votes are gonna go to whoever wins the Republican nomination and that wouldn't violate any provision of the Constitution. Now, a little bit later, we'll get to the question of whether they could do that after the election or while the election is underway, and I think there's good reason to think that they can't do that. So it might be too late for this election, but there's really no reason why uh, they couldn't do that for future elections. So we have this electoral college. So every state gets a number of electoral votes equal to the number of senators that it has and the number of representatives in the House that it has. So. Every state gets two senators, as we know, and then the rest of it, the House members, is based on population. And that's how we know how many electoral votes each state has. Um, and the original rationale for this were several. First of all, the founders distrusted the voters. The founders were afraid of the tyranny of the majority. They were afraid of mob rule. They liked democracy, but they didn't want too much democracy, or at least some of them. So they thought it would be better to have some wise, learned, educated, aristocratic people as sort of a check on popular passion. So if the mob suddenly you know, got enthralled by a popular demagogue and passions overruled reason, there would be a safety valve to, to check the extremes. That was one rationale. Another rationale was frankly protecting slave states. The, the slave states had a pretty good deal under this system where they uh, would have their uh, population, all of their population count towards their representation in the US House, or actually three fifths of the state of the slaves, but then everybody else. Even though only a small percentage of the population that was white males who were property owners could actually vote. So the, the small sliver of the population who were white male property uh, owners in slave states had a sweet deal because there were only a few of them that could actually vote, but in terms of their representation in the house, they got to count everybody. And if they uh, went to a national popular vote, that would take away that advantage. And so some of them didn't wanna ratify the constitution unless there was an electoral college. And there were other states that said, well, if that's what it takes to get their votes, it's better to have a constitution than no constitution. So there was a compromise. And then finally, protecting small states. The idea was that if it was a national popular vote, then Virginia and New York would just swamp everybody else. And the Delawares and the Connecticut's and even the North Carolinas would pretty much not count for anything. They were afraid of that anyway. So the Electoral College, by giving every state at least two electoral votes representing their representation in the US Senate, it kind of evened things out a little bit between the large states and the small states. Now, there are a couple of anti-democratic features of the Electoral College. One of them we're gonna talk about in a minute about how you can win the popular vote and still lose in the Electoral College. But an even more glaring one is that the electors don't have to actually follow the results of the election. In the early part of our history, a lot of states didn't have presidential elections. It wasn't until the 1840s that all states had uh, adopted an election for president. Most of them adopted elections pretty early on, but not all of them. Um, but even in those states where you have elections, 
individual electors, the human beings who are, go to, the elect, to meet in this capital of each state six weeks after the election to meet in the electoral college meeting of that state, th there's nothing in the Constitution that says they have to pay attention to the election results. And throughout history, we have had these so-called faithless electors. Not a lot, but you know, every now and then, 180 times in our history, and the last election, 2016, was a record. We had seven so-called faithless electors who said, I don't really care what the voters in my state said. I don't agree with that. I'm going to vote for somebody different. It's never been enough to change the outcome of an election, but it's concerning, at least to some people. It's still only a tiny fraction of the total number of electoral votes that have been cast in history. Now, most states have outlawed this. Um, they have said, don't do this. And a lot of them say, if you do it, then we're going to give you some sort of a fine, like $1,000. Some of them, 15 of them, say, well, we're just not going to count your vote. We're going to swap you out for somebody who will vote faithfully. There was a big issue up until recently. Uh, oh, and Tennessee, by the way, does require faithful voting, but it doesn't cancel the vote or impose any kind of penalty. So you're basically on your honor system to obey the law and ca cast a vote for the, whatever the people say. It was a big issue about whether the electors had a constitutional uh, right to uh, be faithless. And there was some argument for that. I mean, the language of Article 2 and also the 12th Amendment, which also governs presidential elections, talks about these electors voting and giving their votes and casting their ballots. That, along with some language from the founders like Alexander Hamilton, in the Federalist Papers who said, no, it's important for these wise aristocrats to serve a check on mob rule. There's some reason to think that, well, maybe then the Constitution contemplates that faithless electors have the right to be faithless if they want. Uh, it wasn't actually, if you can believe it or not, until this year that we finally got an answer to that question. The Supreme Court, in a case called Chiafalo, said that a state legislature, if it wants to, by legislation, can bar faithless electors. It can say, if you don't vote the way the voters told you to vote, then you're out and we're gonna swap you in for somebody who'll do the right thing. And of course, we know that not all states have done that. Only 32 states in DC have done that. Uh, and basically their rationale was article two says, in such manner as the legislature shall direct, the legislature has plenary authority, right? The Supreme Court said, so plenary authority means we can outlaw faithless electors, right? So now we've at least got that uh, issue squared away. And of course, this is consistent with history and practice. But far more concerning, I think, to many people is the idea that a candidate A can get more votes nationwide, but still lose to candidate B who got fewer votes nationwide because of the Electoral College. Um, and the culprit in all these situations is the winner-take-all allocation of electoral college votes. So that is to say, if um, Clinton is up against Trump and Trump wins by 50.00001% in a state, then Trump gets 100% of all of the electors. There is no proportional allocation. But likewise, at the same kind, if Clinton runs up huge super majorities in California, and New York gets 70, 80% of the vote. Every one of those votes above 50% is essentially wasted. Now, she doesn't get any more electoral college votes for that. So it's possible that a candidate who ekes out a narrow majority in a lot of states will win electoral, electoral college wise, even though there were other candidate, another candidate racked up huge majorities in other states and ended up having more votes nationwide. And that has, in fact, happened five times in our history, twice in this century, right? So Al Gore in 2000 and Hillary Clinton in 2016 got the national popular vote, but did not, in fact, get sworn in on January 20th. So what are the modern rationales for this? Presumably, most people aren't convinced that it's necessary to protect slaveholding states. And probably, presumably, most people aren't convinced that you know, the people are too stupid and emotional and they need, you know, wise aristocrats to help them. The modern rationales for keeping the electoral college, A, electoral certainty. 
the idea is that you know right away who won and you don't have to worry about uh, nasty recounts. But actually, the math points in the other direction. It's more likely that you're going to have a razor thin margin of victory that ends up becoming disputed for weeks on end if you carve it up into these chunks, right? As we saw that in 2000 in Florida. Statistically, it's much less likely that you're going to have that kind of a razor thin margin when you have 100 million or 150 million people voting nationwide. But if you carve that 150 million up into 50 different chunks, then the idea that there's going to be a really close election leading everything into uncertainty is more likely. And we saw that, like I said, in 2000 with Florida. Uh, the other big ration, yes, question. Was there a question? Oh, and uh, Sue Ann, I just realized when I'm in uh, presentation mode and I'm looking at the pictures, I don't see the chat room. So will you be the chat room monitor for me? And if someone throws in a question by chat, will you interrupt me? Great, thank you, Sue Ann. All right, the other one is the regional diversity idea. We don't want somebody to rack up huge that is hated and feared in the Midwest and the mountain states and the Pacific Northwest and the Southeast, et cetera, et cetera. The analogy here you sometimes hear from Electoral College Defenders is the World Series. In the World Series, you have to win four out of seven games. It doesn't matter how many total runs the a baseball team has. That's not how you count it. If you, you know, if you had, if you only won one game out of seven, but you know, that score was 100 to one in terms of runs, that still doesn't cut yet, you know, any slack. So that's what they, uh, some of the defenders have said. I think there are a number of problems personally with this argument. Uh, first of all, no matter how you add it up, whether you're at talking total votes or electoral college votes, there is no one region or even two regions together that can control the presidential election. So right now, Democrats usually control the Northeast and they control the Pacific Coast and Republicans will control the Southeast and a lot of the mountain states. But even, that's, even though that's the case, no one can win under either system, national popular vote or electoral college, unless you can make inroads in the Midwest. So the idea that you know, one or two regions can dominate doesn't really work math wise anymore. Um, and then the other question is, what do you think is most important to people? If you talk to Republicans in the Northeast or Democrats in the Southeast, are they gonna be more concerned about making sure that their region's overall preference is respected? Or are they gonna be more concerned about which party wins? I think nowadays party is more salient for most voters than region. I think most people have more of a, of a, a dead died in the wool allegiance to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party than they do to being a resident of the Southeast or the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and with respect to the World Series uh, uh, analogy, the you know, World Series is not designed to figure out who is the best team that year. If, you, if that's all you wanted to find out, then you could just look at the win-loss record over 180 games over the course of a baseball season. That's the best way to do it. We do it with the World Series because it's fun, it's exciting, it's entertaining, right? But we're not trying to make the presidential election entertaining, we're trying to figure out who the people want to be president. As one uh, law professor put it when he was testifying about this before Congress, in baseball, not all runs are equal, but in real life, all votes should be equal. So I think that's why um, many people think that we should reform the Electoral College. Now, the obvious way to do that would be to amend the federal constitution, but frankly, that's never going to happen. In order to amend the constitution, you're going to need two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the state legislatures. And right now, the Electoral College privileges 10 swing states over the other 40 states. Those are the states that get all the attention in campaigning and also get disproportionate attention in governance. The swing states get a disproportionate amount of federal funding, waivers from federal requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Because frankly, a vote in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or North Carolina 
counts a lot more than a vote in Tennessee. We're a deep red state. We can be safely ignored by both Republicans and Democrats because everyone knows we're going we're gonna to go for whoever the Republican nominee is. So no one pays attention to us. So if you take those 10 or 11 states and you just assume they're never going to vote to abolish the Electoral College, seems pretty unlikely that we're ever going to get a constitutional amendment passed. But fortunately for those who wish to reform the Electoral College, there is a workaround. There is a way to remove the, what some people call the anti-majoritarian or anti-democratic tendencies of the Electoral College without actually amending the US Constitution. And that's through the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, an idea which started about 10 years ago. And what the compact is, is an agreement among state legislatures. A state legislature by resolution signs on to the compact and pledges, says, we promise that no matter what the result is in our state, all of our electoral votes will be allocated to whoever wins the overall national popular vote. Now, remember I told you, state legislatures have plenary power. They don't have to respect the results of the election if they don't want to in their state. And this is a, a pledge to respect the national popular vote. Now, the problem with a compact like this is who goes first, right? Because if California does it first, then the Democratic Party, Party is gonna scream bloody murder. What are you doing, California? We have 54 blue electoral votes in the, in the bag. Now you're throwing it up in the air. Why are you doing this? This is unilateral disarmament. You're shooting us in the foot. And if Texas were to go first, the Republican Party would say the same thing. What the heck are you doing, Texas? The genius of the compact is it doesn't take effect until enough state legislatures have signed on to constitute 270 electoral votes and thus to control the outcome of the election. So everyone is gonna walk across the line at the same time. So that's the idea here. Um, we are currently at 196 electoral college votes, which means we still have a ways to go. But really when you think about it, in only 10 years, we've gone from zero to almost 200 electoral votes. We've gone almost 70% of the way towards doing it. Now I know that it's gonna get harder as it gets closer. Um, some of the low hanging fruits already been uh, plucked, but I am, as, a, as an advocate of electoral college reform, I'll just be honest about that. I am cautiously optimistic that in our lifetime, certainly in your lifetime, uh, the electoral college won't be abolished, but it will be rendered harmless. And there's some more data there about how close we've come in other states. All right, there are some legal objections to the compact in addition to the policy objections I talked about earlier. One is under something called the compact clause. There's a provision of the constitution and if you read the language, it certainly sounds like no two states can get into into an agreement or a compact without Congress approving it. So one of the arguments is unless you get a congressional resolution saying this thing is cool, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. Yeah, but I don't think that really works as an objection to it legally because the Supreme Court has interpreted this clause narrowly. They said, look, it couldn't possibly mean that every time two states want to enter into a contract, there has to be an act of Congress. States enter into contracts all the time. You know, there's a, two states that share a border. They get into, you know, border maintenance things or they share a river. They come into a contract about not polluting the river or they share jurisdiction. So the Arkansas State Police can, in an emergency, drive into Tennessee and vice versa. You can't have every single contract require an act of Congress. So they interpret it to apply only to a small subset of interstate compacts that would aggrandize state power at the expense of federal power. And I would think there's a pretty good argument that the National Popular Vote Interstate Com Compact doesn't do that because after all, the Constitution says that when it comes to allocating electors in the Electoral College, it's a, entirely a state deal. It's a state legislative deal. The other objection that you hear sometimes is that it improperly delegates this plenary state legislative authority that's supposed to be so sacred to others. And you're not allowed to do that. You can't take away 
the power of each state legislature to determine the allocation of its own votes. But the response to that is, you're not really doing that. I mean, the state legislature is voluntarily deciding to enter the compact and they can withdraw from the compact whenever they want. The compact says any state can withdraw at any time except not just a few months before the election. Yeah, that, and that's to prevent gamesmanship. You can't like promise to do the right thing, you know, da, da, da. and then as the election gets close and it realize the candidate you like isn't winning, suddenly pull out, right? So except for that, state legislatures can come in or come out whenever they want. Uh, and there's another recent Supreme Court case that shed some light on this. Uh, in this case, the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission case, the voters of Arizona using uh, a referendum process that had been set up by the state legislature under state election law, voted to amend the state constitution to take away redistricting power, basically the power to gerrymander, from the politicians and put it in the hands of an independent redistricting commission. The state legislature sued saying, the constitution using the same legislature word that it uses with respect to the presidential electoral college thing, said the state legislature shall determine the manner of holding US house elections. And it's no longer the legislature doing that. You've taken the power from the state legislature and given it to this redistricting commission. The Supreme Court said, no, no, we're, we're defining legislature broadly. If the state legislature sets up a procedure whereby you amend the state constitution, then they're essentially delegating that power away. And that's totally fine. So I think given that broad conception, I don't think this objection to the NPV compact is gonna fly either. Of course, that's just a prediction. You know, Until the Supreme Court gets it, you never know what's gonna happen. Okay, so that's it for the uh, electoral college. I'll pause for a second. If anyone's got questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Or if you want, you can, you can wait till the end. I'm kind of changing topics a little bit here. All right, let's talk about mail voting. I'm sure you all are smart people who have been um, following the news and you know that mail voting has gone through the roof this year because of the pandemic, but it was actually skyrocketing in use even pre-pandemic. In the, in the last few years, more and more people have decided to do mail voting. In 2018, over 25% of the votes cast in the federal elections, the midterm elections, were cast by mail. So uh, 34 states plus the District of Columbia basically allow anybody who wants to, to vote by mail. Uh, in fact, five of those don't even require that you apply for an absentee ballot. In five states, then these includes both red and blue states, Utah as well as uh, Hawaii and a purple state like Colorado, uh, they just automatically mail everybody a ballot and you can fill it out or not. You don't have to ask for it. And over 90% of the votes are cast by mail. Voting in person is almost unheard of now in uh, these states. And that's been going on for years. But that, and I'll, I'll add, without real problems of fraud or voter error or whatever, you know, the, the things you hear about. Uh, the rest of the country, um, for the most part, says, we're not gonna automatically mail you the ballot, but anybody who wants to can apply for a mail ballot and we'll give you one. Only 16 still have an old fashioned excuse regime. You gotta swear under penalty of perjury that I'm gonna be out of town or, um, you know, I'm incapacitated, I can't get to the polls or, or something along those lines. A lot of them say, if you're, over a certain age, right? So um, Tennessee is one of those states, you have to either be out of town, incapacitated, or over 60 years of age in order to be able to apply affirmatively for an absentee ballot. Of the 16 states that still have an excuse requirement, all but four relax that requirement for the pandemic on the theory that since we're in a once in a century global pandemic and we don't want elections to be a super spreader event, we're gonna have that count as an excuse. Um, our state, the volunteer state was one of the holdouts that said, nope, nope, we're gonna make people vote in person. Um, and there was a lawsuit about that that I was involved in, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, nine states have further reacted to the pandemic by automatically distributing applications to everybody. And some have just decided to automatically distribute ballots, just like those five states, those complete vote by mail states. Um, 
Now, when I talk about a super spreader event, we do have one data point. You might have heard about this very controversial uh, primary in Wisconsin back in April, where there was a big fight between the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats wanted to expand voting by mail access and uh, extend the deadline for when the uh, ballots could get in because the election officials were so overwhelmed by the spike in mail applications and uh, the number of uh, vote polling places shrunk because a lot of the poll workers said, no, I'm not going anymore. I know I signed up, but I ain't doing this because I don't want to catch the COVID. Uh, so then, you know, you had a real problem with long lines forming and everything. And so there was a fight between the Democrats and the Republicans. The, the Democratic governor and the Republican state legislature fought. They took it to uh, state court. It eventually wound up in the U.S. Supreme Court. Long and short of it was they had to do in-person voting. They weren't able to expand or, or extend deadlines the way they wanted to. So you had lines around the block. There was an epidemiological study that was done about a month afterwards that showed with statistically significant data that that actually was a super spreader event, that the rate of COVID did spike in the uh, three weeks after that uh, primary. So, and of course, there's a, a, there's a worry right now about USPS slowdowns and slowdowns in the mail further complicating the situation. But like I said, I was involved in some litigation uh, at Tennessee to try to get this, and it was, for the most part, uh, successful. The case, let's see, there we go. Fisher v. Hargett was uh, the case that I litigated, and I, I filed a, a lawsuit in Davidson County Chancery Court uh, using state law claims only. We, we, we didn't raise any federal claims. We did not want to get dragged into federal court. We wanted to stay in state court. And I think that strategy ended up uh, proving uh, useful because uh, fairly quickly we asked for expedited review because you know the August, we, we filed in early May, we wanted to get ready for the August election. So within a month of our filing, we had had a, a full hearing on the merits and we took evidence and the uh, court ordered that everybody in Tennessee was allowed to vote absentee for the August election. And that was in fact the rule in the August election. Then it went up on appeal to the state Supreme Court and the state Supreme Court restricted that order for November. The Supreme Court said, okay, for August, everybody gets to vote absentee. For November, we're gonna pull back on that a little bit. And we're gonna say, if you have an underlying medical condition that renders you particularly susceptible to COVID or are a caretaker of such a person, you can vote absentee. Otherwise, unless you're over 60 or out of town or et cetera, et cetera, you got to do what the state says and you got to vote in person. Um, then they sent it back down to the trial court and we had proceedings since then, uh, in sort of early August at the trial court, uh, we were able to get the trial court to order the state to put that explanation on the application for absentee ballot form itself, which the state was originally refusing to do. And we also got them to clarify on the form that if you just lived with somebody who was medically vulnerable, then you also could vote absentee, which only makes sense because if you live with them, then if you go out and vote, you know, at a super spreader event, you can come back and infect them and they're medically vulnerable. When you add up all the different conditions that the CDC has said render you medically vulnerable, I mean, I'm just not talking about heart and lung conditions and immunosuppressive uh, conditions and recovering from cancer or organ transplants. I'm just talking about more common things like asthma, type one and type two diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, obesity, smoking. When you add all of that up, plus say anybody who lives with such a person or takes care of such a person, by our estimates, you are well north of two thirds of registered voters in Tennessee anyway. So even though the Tennessee Supreme Court pulled back a little bit, it still was the case and continues to be the case that pretty much anybody who wants to vote absentee probably could still do so if they wanted to. Um, I think I was one point putting it when I was being interviewed by the media that unless you are a healthy 20 something who lives only with other healthy 20 somethings and never looks in on grandma, you can probably vote absentee. So probably a lot of you can't still can't vote absentee, but a lot of us can. Um, and then there was another case in federal district court. Uh, they did not get the same kind of relief that we were shooting for, but they did get the court to clarify that if you're a first time voter who did not 
register in person. Ordinarily, you would be required to vote in person, but because of the pandemic, you wouldn't have to be. All right. Um, of course, it's great that, I mean, I think it's great that a lot of people have the choice to either vote in person or vote by mail. And I think everyone gets to make that choice. And, you know, there's reasons for doing one or reasons for doing another. More recently, there have been a lot of people who said, even though I technically can vote by mail, I'm not sure I'm gonna, because I've heard about all these slowdowns in the mail. And the slowdowns in the mail were not imaginary. They have been documented. And a lot of them were traced, nonpartisan reports have, have come out tracing it to certain management decisions made by the recently appointed postmaster general, a guy named DeJoy, who started cutting back on services. He started saying, uh, you know, if you don't finish your route by the end of the day, you can't you get any overtime. You just got to come back and leave whatever's left for the next day. Or if the people who are sorting it are a little bit behind and you want to wait a few minutes so your truck is fully loaded up, no, you just got to uh, leave on time, things like that. It took out a lot of sorting equipment to slow the processing down, and it really did affect uh, delivery. So there actually was a federal case out in the state of Washington, uh, Washington v. Trump DeJoy et al., in which the court said, you're going to stop this. All these changes that you're making, unchange them, right? And you can't make any more changes that might slow down the mail until after the election. And any piece of mail that is election related has to be given top priority. And I think since that uh, court order, things have gotten a little bit better, but we're still not at the same kind of uh, delivery speeds that we were used to prior to the pandemic. And so what I've been advising people is to allow a week for your application to get sent in and a week for your uh, ballot to come back and then another week for your, uh, well, actually, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. The application can be done by email. So I'm recommending that people do the application by email so that it's instant and then allow five or seven days for the ballot to get to you and five or seven days for the ballot to get out. So basically what I've been telling people is if you plan to vote by mail and you haven't mailed your ballot by now, then I would strongly consider you, uh, suggest that you consider using an overnight service like FedEx and sending it to a physical address of the election commission, which is readily available uh, on the website rather than a PO box. Of course, you don't have to vote by mail, right? Early voting is widely available in Tennessee. That's one of the bright spots of our election system. We do have a really robust and convenient early voting system. And a lot of people are doing that. Oh, I, it is interesting. This is pretty rare. It's very rare that the federal court will make an, a finding that something was intentionally done, but they found that there was an intentional effort to slow down election-related mail, which is pretty extraordinary. Okay, things to think about for election night. The red mirage and the blue shift. The overwhelming majority of people who are voting by mail this year and this giant surge, this unprecedented surge in mail voting are Democrats, the data shows. And so there's a very good possibility that on election night, the networks are gonna be giving you numbers that make it look like there is a Republican victory, both in the presidential race and in the key Senate races. However, that may be what people are calling a red mirage because as the absentee ballot votes get counted, they won't all be able to be counted on election night. It might take a couple of days to count all the absentee ballots. Then you're gonna see a shift to the blue in the Senate elections and in the presidential elections. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the Democrats are gonna sweep all the elections. Who knows? It, either side could win, both the White House and the Senate. I think both are in play in this election. But I do think that you ought to be patient you know, for those of you, those of you political junkies out there who are used to tuning in on election night and letting the networks call it one way or another and going to sleep on election night, confident that you know who controls the Senate and who controls the White House, lower your expectations. It might take longer, you know. Uh, and of course, if there's contested ele election litigation, then we might see what happened in 2000 with Bush v. Gore, where it was like eight weeks before we found out for sure who the president was. 
which leads me to the idea of election challenges. There's a wide variety of possibilities. People could say that absentee ballots shouldn't be counted because they didn't sign it right or they didn't fill it out right, or maybe they should be counted. They shouldn't be counted because they came in late. They should be counted because they have a postmark before election day and they should be given an extra couple of days. You know, there could be voting machine problems. There's, there's any number of things that you could be fighting about on election day. Now that'll only take place if it's a razor thin margin of victory. If it's a lopsided uh, win for either the blue team or the red team, then none of this matters. But if it's close enough that an election contest could change the outcome, then you may see not just one Florida Bush v. Gore, but like three or four of them happening simultaneously in swing states like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, you know, et cetera. This is gonna be a state by state deal. Under our system, it's about six weeks after election day that the electoral college is supposed to meet. Um, hopefully we'll have it resolved before then because if it isn't resolved before then, it gets very complicated, which means that uh, there's three different ways that an election challenge could be decided. One is by the courts, like Bush v. Gore did in 2000. One is by Congress. The Electoral Count Act, uh, this statute 3 USC 1 that I was talking about, this was an act that was passed in the years after the 1876 election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. That was the Bush v. Gore controversy of its day. There were uh, months after the election when no one knew who was gonna win that uh, election because it was really close and there was not one state but four states where there was active disputes about who really won. It was such a mess that Congress passed a law some number of years later on saying, if this ever happens again, we're gonna have set procedures for how to resolve these presidential election disputes. Now, interestingly, they were kind of ignored back in 2000. The US Supreme Court could have let Congress decide that, but they didn't, they took the case. But assuming that there's still good law and they'll be followed, if you don't get the thing resolved by the six weeks after the election, then the Electoral Count Act says that it goes to Congress. And it's gonna be after Congress has sworn in, the new Congress is sworn in after the November election. So depending on the outcome of the election, you could have a Democratic controlled House and a Republican controlled Senate fighting over who is the president, or if the Democrats take the Senate, then you'd have you know, United Democratic Front deciding who takes the Senate. Another scenario in which Congress could decide uh, things would be under the 12th Amendment. Under the 12th Amendment, if no one candidate wins a majority of the electoral votes, let's say a couple of states, there's some sort of election snafu and they don't report any results so that you don't have one candidate in a close race with the majority, then the top three vote getters are supposed to go to the US House with the US House deciding who the president is and the Senate deciding who the vice president is. So while it's not likely, it's theoretically possible that in January we could see a Donald Trump Kamala Harris ticket or a Joe Biden Mike Pence ticket right, depending if, if that's the way that it works. And then the final way that some people are saying it could get decided is state legislatures. Recall at the very beginning of my talk, I was telling you that the state legislatures have plenary authority to allocate electoral uh, votes under our system. Some people are saying, and there's been reporting that uh, the Republican National Committee is like prepared, you know, to, to possibly try this if, if it comes up, is if in a key state, if there's a real election challenge and no one's really sure who won because they're still fighting it out in court, the state legislature, if controlled by one party or another, could just say, we're just calling it for our uh, candidate, right? So, you know, if, say, a Republican legislature could just call it for Trump uh, because there's too much uncertainty, they could say, well, you know, the election got screwed up. We can't trust the results. We're going to exercise our authority. Problem with that last scenario that I see anyway, and there's, you know, there's no case on point, so we don't know for sure, but there seems to be some good legal authority for the proposition that they can do that, but they can't do it after the election. So that same electoral count act that I got, got done telling you about, there's a provision that says 
that uh, if a state gets its result in, in that first six weeks, Congress can't mess with it, but only if they're using procedures that were already in place on election day. And it also says that there must be one uniform day, election day, where all the voting gets done. And you can't do it on any other day than election day. And it says the only exception for that is if there is a failure of the election in a state. And there's plenty of authority to suggest that a failure means like they just don't hold an election. Let's say there's a hurricane or an earthquake or some sort of, you know, the Russians cyber attack. And there's just, you know, only a small percentage of the counties are able to have any election at all. And so you can just declare the election a total failure. That would be one scenario in which the state legislature could just say, okay, all the votes are going to Biden, all the votes are going to Trump. But if there is an election, but there's just a dispute in the courts about who won, like in Bush v. Gore, no one knows for sure, but I think the competent legal authority, the consensus is that doesn't allow the state legislature to try to trump the, the, the election. Now, I've, I've spun all these fancy scenarios, but I just want to say one more time that um, these things will only happen if there is a razor, razor thin margin of victory in, in some key states. If there's enough of a lopsided victory in a few key states, then all these things are, are gonna go poof. They're just you know, uh, thought experiments. And we're gonna know, you know, if not on election night, within a few days, uh, who the president is and which party controls the Senate. So um, I'll finish and then leave time for questions uh, in the way that I often finish my presentations at the law school. I am a big fan of limericks. And uh, so I like to try to encapsulate the key points of my lessons after each class in uh, five, five lines of uh, Irish oriented prose. So I will leave you with this thought. Though uncertainty is a thing we should note as a nation, we're all on the same boat. If you're red or you're blue, there's just one thing to do. Just make sure you get to cast your own vote. And I will end with that. There's my contact information. If anybody wants to contact me afterwards, I'm happy to answer any questions about this or anything else about law school or the law. And let me come back into, into the main mode here. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate the compliment, Zoe. And I'll take questions. Yes, this everybody's being very uh, appreciative of your time. Please ask questions. It's a one of an opportunity to uh, someone who is an expert in this area. So I just wanted to ask, I'm from California and my parents sent me an absentee ballot, like mm -hmm. the one that got sent my address, they sent me it in a package and I have to send it back. So I'm just, because I want them to put it in a box and not send it back myself. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you suggest in that case, if I should put it in a separate envelope, ship it to them, have them depo like deposit it in the box, I think is what the process is. Yeah, so see, you're, you're in one of those, you're lucky because you're in one of those states that has drop boxes. Some states yeah. have drop boxes, a lot of them don't. Um, there was an attempt to try to get drop boxes in Tennessee uh, and our Secretary of State, Trey Hargett, uh, in his wisdom uh, rejected that for reasons I'll let him explain to you. Um, so if I were you, I would FedEx, and I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and do the product placement because I'm from Memphis. So I'm gonna say FedEx and not UPS. I'm gonna say FedEx, uh, the whole thing in a separate envelope to your parents with instructions that as soon as possible, they take it down to their Dropbox. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, there's a question in the chat Yeah. before I ask mine. Oh, well, that's very polite of you. What do I think the chances that this election will be one of those scenarios? I think it is extremely unlikely that the state legislature gambit or the decided by the Congress gambit will occur. I think it is less likely, I, I think it is more likely than not that it won't be decided by the courts. 
but I wouldn't completely dismiss it. So I very, very low chance that the courts or, I mean, that state legislatures or Congress are gonna decide anything. More of a chance that the courts will decide, but I still think less than 50%. And the reason I say that is just because, you know, um, the polling seems to pre, suggesting that it's not going to be one of those razor thin Bush v. Gore like margin of victories. Now I know the polling was wrong in 2016. I understand that, but pollsters have made, first of all, pollsters have made some changes to their turnout projection models, learning from their 2016 mistakes. And second of all, the, the polling gap is larger in 2020 than it was in 2016. So I'm guessing more likely than not, the, uh, the courts won't decide it, but you can't rule that out. But I think the, the state legislature Congress thing, I, I think is just speculative. What was your question that you were speaking before? Oh, yeah. I was wanting to know, uh, going back to the mail issue, why was the, well, why was he not just outright fired? It sounds like that was his blatant attempts at tampering with the election results. It's near inexcusable. Uh, and so say again, I, what did you think was the blatant tampering with the election results? Go back again. Uh, I mean, it just feels like he was blatantly trying to stop the election from having the results of, of well, a fair election. Yeah, Who why was? was uh, the, the, the general, the male general. I, my, the postmaster you know, general, the blank. Trump appointee. Oh, the postmaster general. Oh. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm right. drawing a blank right now. I'm no, sorry. No, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure which controversy you're referring to. Well, I think his, his explanation was he was trying to do efficiency measures and some of the equipment that he took out wasn't necessary. It was redundant and he was trying to cut costs on overtime by having those restrictions. And I think at least some of the things that he did apparently had already been planned by the Postal Service, even uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, but the counter argument was, nonetheless, once the pandemic occurs and mail voting is going through the roof, then this is not the time to economize, right? So- well, there I mean, did they have any numbers like forecast, um just look at what this could do in the long run, at least. You know, they, they had projected dollar savings uh, from the cutbacks, but they didn't have projected effect on mail delivery times. And they did not have good projections on the increase in mail voting. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And sorry for drawing a blank earlier. No, no, it's okay. Um, Anna asked the question, if you request an absentee ballot and you decide to go home to vote, oh, when you say home, in Tennessee or outside Tennessee? She's from Memphis. Oh, okay. <laughs> then what will happen is when you show up, they will flag you as someone who had requested an absentee ballot and they'll make you vote a provisional ballot, which is a paper ballot and then they'll put your ballot to the side and then they'll wait. And if they see that you never did cast your absentee ballot, then they'll, ca then they'll count your provisional ballot. Um, do I think the district method of voting like split electoral votes, oh, you're welcome, will become popular? I think what Emma is referring to is there are two states, Maine and Nebraska, that allocate electoral votes by congressional district. So if you win the congressional district, as a presidential candidate, then you get one vote. And then whoever wins the state gets the two votes that correspond to the, you know, the state, the, the US Senate, right? Every state gets two votes plus one for each uh, house district. And so that's the way that Maine and Nebraska does it. Um, do I think it'll become more popular? A, I don't think it will become more popular. Um, it hasn't caught on for many decades. And B, I'm not rooting it personally, to become more popular. And here's why. A lot of you know that when you draw a house district, there's a lot of gerrymandering that goes, that goes on. Some of it is intentional. Some of it is the natural uh, gerrymandering that occurs when you draw lines and you've got over-concentration of Democrats in the cities and under-concentration in the, in the rural areas. I think 
if you go to the main Nebraska system, you are just importing the evils of gerrymandering into the electoral college system. So it's not really that much better than the screwed up system we have right now. I, I personally think that the clear solution is the national popular vote interstate compact. This is a little bit off topic, kind of going to, I guess, procedural things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a relevant question and I definitely don't mean any disrespect, but especially when um, President Trump contracted coronavirus, I think a lot of people were wondering in terms of the e election, what would happen if a candidate passed away? So do you have an answer for that? Like, I didn't know if the nomination would go to his running mate or the next highest vote getter in the party. Um, it's, so, yeah. it's a perfectly legitimate question and a lot of media folks were speculating about it uh, when they found out that uh, the president got coronavirus. I mean, he's 74 years old and, you know, significantly overweight according to all the measures that they have. So he had risk factors. And the answer is that if a candidate uh, dies prior to the election, then the national committee of that party is able to meet and uh, choose a, a replacement candidate. So at this point, and, and at the time that Mr. Mr. Trump got COVID, it was too late to actually change the names on the ballot. But the Republican National Committee could have met and appointed somebody. It wouldn't have to be Mike Pence, could be Mike Pence, it would need to be as the replacement. And then they would just message out to their voters, you know, vote for Trump and you'll get Mitt Romney or, you know, uh, Ted Cruz or Mike Pence or whoever. And that's the way that would work. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, so the, uh, Blaine asks a question about U.S. territories that don't have uh, statehood. Yeah, so the U.S. territories like uh, Guam or the uh, Virgin uh, Islands don't get to vote for uh, president and they don't get to any representation in Congress. And, uh, you know, D.C. gets to vote for president because they amended the Constitution, but it doesn't get congressional representation and Puerto Rico doesn't get representation either. Do I... Do I have any hope? Yeah, yeah, here's my hope. Uh, so first of all, in reverse order, the NPV compact just treats them like, would treat them like any other state. If, if the law has changed to allow them to, to vote for president and they get a certain number of electoral votes, then you know, they can join the compact or not, right? And of course, if enough states join the compact to control 270 votes, then it doesn't really matter what the rest of the states do, right? They're, they're, they're out of luck. Um, our reason I have hope, and I, I'm speaking as someone who thinks they deserve representation, is now that with the Republicans' decision to rush through a confirmation of a Supreme Court justice, despite many of them saying something arguably inconsistent four years ago when they declined to give uh, President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, even a hearing or to meet with him, that has, um, I think, really radicalized a lot of people who are not Republicans and saying, you know, the gloves are off. And if we take over, we're going to, you know, we're going to use all the constitutional levers at our disposal. So court packing is on the table. And I think so is statehood for D.C. and statehood for Puerto Rico if Puerto Rico were to hold another referendum and indicate, as they have in the last several referenda, that they're interested in statehood. So... I think all those things are on the table. So, you know, it's possible that in our lifetime, we'll see uh, full voting representation in the presidential election and congressional elections for those people. Oh, um, I got to answer this question. I know we might be coming up on the buzzer and I don't want to go over time, but I will, like, if I could, I would physically hold you in the room so I could answer this question from Emma. What do I think about ranked choice voting as a replacement for the Electoral College? I'm a big uh, proponent of ranked choice voting. In fact, I wrote a book about it, that book that uh, Ms. Mc Dr. McClellan was talking about earlier and when she did the introduction to me. For those of you who are not familiar with it, ranked choice voting very quickly says that you can say, here is my first choice, here is my second choice, here is my third choice, right? And then if one candidate gets a majority of the first place votes, they win like in any other election, it's fine. 
But if no one candidate wins because the vote is split multiple ways, then you eliminate the candidate who is weakest, who has the fewest number of first place votes. And you take all their ballots and you redistribute them among the remaining candidates based on who those voters second choice was. So that way their vote isn't wasted. Right? And it has a lot of advantages. Um, you know, third party candidates are not irrelevant anymore. So Ralph Nader can't be the spoiler, you know, uh, and you also, because of that, you, can't, you don't have to say, oh, oh, I would never vote for Jill Stein or um, Gary Johnson because I'm just throwing away my vote. No, you can, you can give them your support, but just as a backup, go to somebody else, right? And can this be used for presidential elections? Absolutely. And in fact, the state of Maine several years ago adopted ranked choice voting for all its federal elections. They have held congressional elections and U.S. Senate elections with ranked choice voting. And this year for the first time, we will be using ranked choice voting for the presidential election and the, uh, a close U.S. Senate election. And that will mean that we won't have spoiler problems with you know, third party candidates uh, gumming up the works, uh, if, if you will. And I'm a big proponent of it. And um, how exactly that works with the National Popular Vote Compact is a more complicated and interesting question that I don't have time to go into now. But if you wanted to uh, contact me afterwards, I'd be happy to go into that. Um, yeah, do I think without ranked choice voting, third party means anything? In other systems around the world that have proportional representation systems or ranked choice voting systems, third parties have real power. They have real sway. They may not control the outcome of the election, but their ideas get a serious listen to. And it's a, it's a diversity of ideas. But in our system, because it's winner take all, it basically crowds out all third parties. It's either Coke or it's Pepsi, right? And it, there's no other choice. Um, and the only royal, a role that third parties can play is the role of spoiler, which I think is tragic because I think third parties on both the left and on the right have ideas to offer. You know, maybe you don't agree with everything they say, but they have a legitimate voice in the debate and they deserve a seat at the table. And ranked choice voting, along with a similar related system called proportional representation, um, allows for that multiplicity of uh, representation. Uh, your what you're saying about third parties getting a voice, as it stands right now, third parties get absorbed by the two major ones predominantly, like Coke and Pepsi. Pepsi absorbed Mountain Dew into its group and kind of removed them as a competitor. Right. So if we went to ranked choice, do you think that that would stop the two major parties from absorbing these third parties? Um, it would stop them from actually absorbing the parties to the point where the parties evaporated. Right? It wouldn't stop them from borrowing ideas from the third parties because since ranked choice voting would make the third parties more competitive, the major parties would have to pay more attention to their ideas. And so you'd see the major parties borrowing from the left and the right more than they do right now. And let me give you an example of this dynamic. When I wrote that book that uh, Dr. McClellan was kind enough to plug for me, but by the way, which is now available in paperback form, very affordable from <laughs> Amazon and other, <laughs> other sources. Um, but I wrote it in Australia, where I studied their system, where they have ranked choice voting and proportional representation at the national level. So their U.S. Senate, it's not like you have to win all of the state, right? If you get a portion of the vote, then that par third party gets a portion of the representation. And there, the Green Party gets about 10% of the seats, right? It's not enough to control, but it's enough to have a seat at the table. And because they have ranked choice voting, the major parties will bargain with the third parties for cross endorsement. So the Labour Party, which is like the Australian version of the Democratic Party, they'll go to the Green Party and they'll say, obviously you're gonna tell your Green Party diehards to vote for you, rank you first, but could you please tell them to rank us second? And the Green Party says, maybe, but what's in it for me? Well, what do you want? We want more aggressive climate change stuff. You got it, right? So now, Ideas are being shared, you know, and ideas that used to be outside the mainstream are finding their way into the mainstream because the system incentivizes that kind of cross endorsement and that kind of cooperation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, moving to por proportional representation. So, Anne, did you set these questions up? Did, like, did you say, Mulroy really likes proportional representation, ranked choice voting. Just be on his good side and humor him and, and ask him his pet projects. I, 
This is amazing. Travis and Emma, um, you definitely need to come to this law school when, when you're ready. Uh, we would get along really well. But um, no, proportional representation, I think, is even more important than ranked choice voting. So under a winner-take-all system, you get 50.01% of the vote, you get 100% of the power. And a consistent minority that election after election shows up and gives 40% of the vote, they get nothing. They go home and they become alienated and disappointed and they stop turning out. If you're a Republican in Massachusetts or you're a Democrat in Mississippi, you might as well not exist, right? It's a joke, right? Proportional representation reverses all of that. If there is a cohesive political minority, racial ethnic minority, partisan minority, ideological minority, LGBTQ minority, I don't care, whatever it is, they vote together and they consistently control 37.6% of the vote, then they're gonna get under proportional representation roughly, give or take, with rounding error, 37% of the power. And again, it's not enough to control. You, you never give minority majority control, but you at least give them a seat at the table. Um, and that means that everybody is incentivized to turn out all the time, right? Because if you're a Republican in Massachusetts, you know you're not gonna win a majority, but if you mobilize your voters, that can mean the difference between you getting five of 15 seats versus seven of 15 seats, or you know, three to five on the legislature. So every election is competitive, every vote counts, and when the dust settles, every voter can point to at least one person and say, I voted for that person, that person represents me. And right now, if you're a Republican in Massachusetts or a Democrat in Mississippi, you might as well be in outer Mongolia for the election, right? Nothing matters, right? All it does is makes you get pissed off. So that's one of the reasons why I think that proportional representation is even more important than ranked choice voting. Now, this is real quick. I know we're, we're over time. We're going to end here. Most places around the world have proportional representation in at least one of their two national legislative bodies. The United States and Canada are really the outliers by not doing that. And that's just for historical reasons. We borrowed winner take all from England and we've never changed. But most of them do it by a parliamentary system. You know, so like you don't really vote for the person, you vote for the party and you don't vote for the president. It's just whoever's the leader of the party that takes control, they become prime minister. And then you can recall the prime minister whenever you want. And there's no regularly scheduled elect. It's, it's a strange, it, it works for them. But I think most people would say in America, we don't do that, right? And that's fine. We don't have to have a parliamentary system. There is a system that uses ranked choice voting called the single transferable vote, which can achieve proportional representation without adopting a parliamentary view. And I can't go into it in all the detail, but if you look up how they elect people uh, at local elections in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Minneapolis, Minnesota, or the Australian Senate, you'll see that they use ranked choice voting to achieve proportional representation, and it has worked quite well for many, many decades. Okay, I think the other things are all about how you get credit, so I'll, uh, I'll end there. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Come join our law school. Yes, and... Um, if, is there anything, Dean McClellan, that you want to post about law admissions for University of Memphis or let the students know? Hey, Sue Ann, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you so much. Appreciate right, take it. Care now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, I put my email there. We are, um, I'm available to talk to anybody by email or by Zoom. Um, we are doing individual tours. If you find yourself in Memphis, uh, due to COVID, it's not one day. It is self-scheduled with our ambassadors. So send me an email and I'll connect you. If you have questions, we do not have an application fee, um, but we do have to pay the fees to LSAT. But um, priority deadline's March 15th. We are taking uh, flex LSAT. So if, if anybody's worried about that, um, that's not an issue. And every year in our in class, we there's uh, usually a quarter of the class, sometimes a little more, are UT grads. There's always a competition between Memphis and UT and who has 
the most grads and some years it's Tennessee and some years it's Memphis. So I hope some of you are, are seriously looking at us. And I thank you all for joining me. Mr. Mulroy is amazing. Um, I would not be surprised if uh, you turn on uh, one of the major networks in the next few days and he's being interviewed. I have been in a different part of the country and turned on the television, you know, MSNBC and CNN, and there's Mr. Mulroy. I was like, oh my God, you know, but he is sought out heavily um, and is an expert in this area. So um, I hope you found his talk interesting. Um, he does enjoy uh, bantering with students, so don't hesitate to uh, reach out to him. His limericks are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that is literally the way he ends every class and every meeting and and uh, he did that with the staff when he was associate dean. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, did the Kappa Alpha Pi need to say anything to their members really quick? Um, any announcements that we have we can just put in like an email or a group message. Um, we just really wanted to come hear this lecture and it was such a great opportunity. All of our members have been saying how much they enjoyed um, this. It was just an amazing opportunity. So thank you so much. Awesome. And will you, um, Dean McClellan, will you be, you said you were recording this. Yes. And you want to send me the link in yeah. as soon as I figure out how to do that but <laughs> yeah oh, take your time. and everyone also go vote so yes please vote um I think there was some instructions uh by Miss Cooper on where you can vote on yes campus. if you're registered in Knox County there's early voting on campus at UT Knoxville's campus next week all week 8 a.m to 8 p.m um I put a link you can learn more at ballsvote.utk.edu. I'll just repost that really quick because it's way up there. Does anybody have any questions they want answered related to law school admissions or Mr. Mulroy? Um, don't ask me to comment on his expertise because I'm not an expert in that area. Okay. Sorry, I, I did one question. Could you um just, do you have his email? I just didn't get a chance to write it down. Um, I do, but I, it's gonna, hang on a second. It's okay, I, I'll, I can just email you and ask, ask yeah, you for email it. Email me email. and I'll send it to you. Um, if I can get to my email without interrupting this chat, um, probably the best thing to do, it's, it's or to go on our website, law school, you, it's memphis.edu forward slash law, and then um, click on the faculty section, and then he is um, listed there, and his email is on that site as well. Perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you spend some time listening to the debate. They are in Tennessee tonight at Belmont. So um, I think they'll be starting shortly. Thank you and good luck and vote. Thank you again. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.